나 얘네가 비틀리다 한다. 뭐 그냥 그분 솔로 가면 안 돼요? 오케이. 어 그분가 용 쳐줘야 될것 같아. 우리 다 아직 다 밀고 있음. 미드 나 주의 부심네. 어 호서 우리 어, 치고 있다. 나, 나. 어 보고 있어 보고 있어. 앞에. 난 여기서 자리를 볼까 그래. 나. 용자 이거 아. 너 이길 좀 아껴줘야 돼. 우리 스나스 별로긴 한데 그냥 포킹 해봐. 야, 이거 이거 야 이거 왜 아지르? 포킹 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 포킹. 아지 아지 아지. 처음에 이제 그만 쳐도 돼. 아지 아지 아지. 아지 중에 포킹. 아지 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 용자. 야, 스마트 한다, 얘네. 아, 스마트 한다, 얘네. 볼게, 볼게. 나이스, 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 아 탈론이 형 이게 아 나이스 어, 아 용준이 형 수고했다 어, 나이스! 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 You just heard the insane comms from Khan <laughs> and the rest of Dom1 Kier as they took the win over T1 in the semi-finals in Sounds of the Game presented by Bose. Gentlemen, it is one and one. We are all tied up. And let's see what's going to change as we hop into the draft. I feel like draft has been so beautifully pivotal in this series already. It certainly has. I mean, what, we've seen a zillion, yeah. Yasuo, Irelia, Malzahar in the world finals, yeah. like crown vibes right well, now. Yeah, one, of the, one of the single best players in the world on Malzahar <laughs> and utilizing it extremely effectively and the power points of that champion. Ooh, but EDG now on blue, Kobe. Yeah. And that was something that we talked about at the end of last game. How will things shift? Well, Kiana Rakan already taken off the board. This is a big one. I wonder what they're actually gunning for when it comes to the first pick, because these are very different bands to come in here. It's double support bands from and, Damon Kier right now. And we're seeing some slight variation because there's so much focus on the bottom lane for EDG, you know? Double banning on these enchanters here. The Nami ban on red side, actually, so they can't get the Lucian combination. So, Yumi, Ezreal gone. Nami, Lucian gone. Aphelios, Lulu is the last one left for this EDG bot lane. So Dom will now have a choice because you know that Aphelios is going to be the priority. So you could leave Lee open right now and say, we will happily give you your Aphelios so that we can get Lee Sin and then they can just get themselves the Jin too. And Twisted Fate though, you're giving over so many. They're trying to get the trade on the backside for the Lee Sin and the Twisted Fate. How badly do you want it? I actually absolutely Ooh. love this though because it means that you leave up so many priority picks. So now you've got Aphelios Lee Sin on the side of Dom on Kier, and you yep. take that trade, <laughs> right? Yes, for, you do. It, it's a really strong way to set up that two for one trade, you know, because you are on red side, so leaving all of them up and then doing the target ban last ban here at the Jarvan is a lot of value for DK. And if you get last pick LeBlanc, that is really frightening, especially if you are on the red side, because then you, you get to ban out the answers to it as well as the Jace. Looking to come in for Flandre, a big favorite for him and a good pick away from Khan as well, especially now that the Graves has been banned away. This this pick, like it can't be LeBlanc. So it is going to be that ultimate three picks for Damo. This is such an insane topside early opening of the draft though for the, for the side of EG. When you have a twisted fate supplementing the pressure of Jace, th this provides so much kill opportunity up there. JJ on the Xin Zhao can go up, repeat visits, Twisted Fate. There is a reason that he has been banned for so long throughout the knockout stage here at this tournament. So much side lane control afforded by this pick. And I was actually just thinking about it, right? And I was thinking LeBlanc, the obvious choice. They hovered that one first, but the Silas has been the popular answer into Twisted Fate. But we haven't had to talk about it because Twisted Fate has been perma banned for what feels like three months. And it has been popular, but it hasn't been effective in, in a lot of the counters yeah. to Twisted Fate. So we're going to have to see if, if Dom1 are actually the ones that can that can do it. Um, yes, you can steal away the Twisted Fate ultimate and try and hover there and try and uh, match, you know, that map mobility. But early on, especially too, Silas has to trade a lot of health to try and gain access to that minion wave. And it allows some pressure to really build on the top side of the map. I think the EDG need to consider a cannon ban as well, because you kind of look at this draft from Dom1 and Obviously, I think that their priority will be to try and match in the mid jungle two versus two, a very volatile part of the map. And as EG tries to go topside, you expect Darmwan to head towards the bot side 
of the map. So some of the things that Khan can still have impact on, even if he's put behind, are things like the cannon that just offer so much teamfight value and also complement this Aphelios extremely well. I have a feeling in my waters that there might be a Cogmore Lulu. I don't know why, but just have a feeling Cogmore Lulu could be on the table. Of course, still up and can be very, very strong, especially when there's not a whole lot of uh, magic damage. The Lucian gonna be the final ban, certainly aimed against Khan, of course, yeah. because he'll get counter pick. I expect Thresh to be picked up here as a common pairing alongside the Aphelios. Oh no, they're going to step away from it. A lot more disruption would be okay. a potential and flexibility with the Gragas. Exactly. You can you can engage or disengage with this champion and also you can you can sustain through some harassment on top side and not play so up into the Jace and into that twisted fate open arms that is gonna try and pull off those repeat ganks on you. Like the Lucian ban here, you know, some respect to Khan. Yep. The team did get him that pentakill as well earlier in the tournament. He's had quite a Quite a tournament as far as the last dance goes. Yeah, exactly. But I think the fact that Gragas can be support or top lane is also very strong. They can choose their counter pick. They can, if the bottom lane looks too strong, Jin and Leona is going to be a pretty standard lock-in and something they should have been expecting. So now you could just put Gragas on the bottom side of the map and use him as disengage when Leona decides to go in. Yeah, they have a lot of options at their disposal. We also did see Khan actually bring this out as an answer. Uh, in their best of five against tier one, and he basically just played weak side, right? But the amount of disruption that it can offer in a team fight as well, Jin suddenly becomes a lot harder to play every time you ult. Well, there's the risk of the Gragas ultimate knocking you into the team or just interrupting it, uh, and there's a lot of options there for Dom one, but it's definitely not a top side focused draft for them. But also, I think what's great about this Gragas is it offers them another form of engage. Because when you kind of look at this draft from Darmon, when you have the Braum, you're kind of relying on Lee Sin ultimates, perhaps Silas stealing away a Leona ultimate as a means to start a fight if you're even looking for a fight. But Gragas adds that additional pick threat and disruption that can make their team fighting that much stronger. Yeah, EDG have drafted themselves a lot of priority here as far as choosing the engagements. And Darmon investing pretty heavily in counter engage and a lot of answer and shadowing sort of situations here so edg put up on that pedestal to be able to determine a lot of the these early movements and see if they can start to open up this lead whereas damon do have some answers but they have to be cautious early on and also another thing about damon is they don't play through bottom side they are so good at a weak side bottom lane aphelios is not a weak side champion aphelios you need to put resources in so we're already going to see a pivot and a change up for how damon are going to navigate this game, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Ghost can hold his own here, because this guy, I swear, when it comes to international tournaments, he triples his skill level. Like, I'm so used to talking about, go oh, he's the weak link. Oh, if you're ever going to beat Darmon, it's through the bottom lane. Doesn't work when you get to the World Championship. Oh. Well, they're putting him to the test right now, putting him on that Aphelios, Thedius. They certainly are. And what always impressed me about Ghost was it was when he joined Damwon that you really saw yeah. the, the outburst of this Damwon becoming a huge contender both domestically and internationally. So he is a large part in the key can, uh, part of their success. And we heard from Viper himself, Ghost has learned to be exactly what Damwon needs. So let's see if he can be what Damwon needs to get them an edge in this best of five as many members have made their way to the top lane. Yeah. A little bit of a meeting here as Mako is going to get the bad news. A lot of friendship there, but the Winter's Bite not quite able to travel enough of the distance. I'm really glad that you brought that up because Viper was very respectful uh, to Ghost in exactly uh, that interview that you're talking about. And it was really good to hear from him and the fact that he knew that he needed to be respected. Viper always been a very, very intelligent player and just so good at everything around the game as well as just pushing his buttons correctly. So <laughs> great to see from the guy. But the thing was, Ghost and Nuclear had basically the same playstyles. Just Ghost played the, the weak side bottom lane just that little bit better than Nuclear, fit into the jigsaw puzzle that was Darmon Kia much better. Well, now he's got to play into Jin Leona with the Twisted Fate on the opposing team. So, yes, he's got cleanse, but you only got one cleanse. There's so much. Speed. Easiest cast to curse of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how he does. Early ward invested from Showmaker. Very common. You can see this early ward invested from EDG as well onto the red buff to gain a bit of information. Curious as to what. Canyon decides to do with his pathing. Will he look for an early got a uh, top gank, or instead will he just do a top side clear and path down towards bot? The fact that he's doing Raptors into 
Krugs and then Red. He's trying to get that respawn timer starting up earlier so that he can invest more into clearing his camps and, you know, getting more gold into his back pocket uh, as the Red buff is likely going to be the next step. Yeah, well, the big reason he's definitely not pathing towards top side is because you don't want to path into pushing top lane and mid lane right, exactly. matchup because you can't get your scuttle crab. And so you really have to look towards the bottom half. And so, yeah, he's doing... He's min-maxing. Exactly. Yeah. Small camps first so you can get them respawning. End up on the bottom side of the map because guess what? Jace and Twisted Fate are going to push in both of these lanes for EDG. Then it's up to, for EDG though, and for JJ, can he actually cover uh, and and work off of those those pushing lanes to create more of an advantage? As Canyon might even pass through mid on his way down to bottom. See whether he can possibly find something. A flash on the table right now as the chains will connect. There's the oh. gold card. This could just be first blood. The flash over the wall, the double flashes. And that should secure. <laughs> no, the chain lash comes in and Scout survives. Whoa, Canyon actually canceled his auto attack and couldn't get it onto Scout. That should have been a kill for Dom1. Double flashes invested and Dom1 fall just short. The smallest margins, the difference between life and death here for Scout. He barely survived off of that tower dive. He's right back to it with the teleport out here, though. It still was a pretty efficient gank from Canyon because he didn't use a lot of time, but taking his flash and actually sustaining that much damage from the tower means he's actually going to give up so much priority. So he went back to Wolves, heal off of those, then transition down to that bottom scuttle crab. Yeah, we got a push in here from Darmon on the bottom side of the map. Able to utilize this uh, Felios Braum quite effectively right now, but nothing too much is going to come from it. Canyon on the bottom side means that Darmon Kia can feel very comfortable uh, doing this. Nico taking a bit of damage, but he's Leona. So never get the idea that Leona is killable. That is uh, rule number <laughs> one when it comes to League of Legends. Braum in a similar boat in many, yeah. a in many aspects. We need to temper ourselves yeah. when it comes to the bottom lane, I think. Yeah, there'll be a lot of trading for sure, um, but whether or not we'll actually see any deaths is very uh, dependent on the junglers. And perhaps mid lane intervention. A lot of summoners have been burnt. Level 6 is still a little bit away, but it's that top side of the map that we're really looking at for EDG. You can see a small CS discrepancy starting to build up for Flandre, but he is keeping that wave underneath the tower. He gained information on where Canyon was. He knows that he cleared his top side first, then passed towards the bot side of the map. And it's at this point where he now needs to be a little bit cautious because supports are going to go back to base and they're going to be looking to roam around the map. And with those top side camps available, this is a good opportunity for Darmon to look to try and attack Flandre. So you can't just having a drink up here towards the top side, feeling pretty good. Only six CS behind, but you expect Jace to have control of this lane, absolutely. Things gone pretty much as expected. We'll see whether the junglers are going to spot one another, as right now it's Showmaker that's closest to JJ. He's uh, just in this mid lane, hanging out. Yeah, it's spotted now as the uh, Scry's Bloom comes out. And there's a big uh, extra small objective now around this mid lane. A as big as extra small <laughs> Ex Yeah, yeah, yeah. You love it, right? <laughs> all the sizes. It's all wrapped up around mid lane because of all the flashes that were blown here, looking for those repeats. And now you get to see the supports coming too. So there was a small window there where Mako actually got back out onto the map first because Beryl and Ghost decided to stay for an extra wave in bot lane. That means that Mako is currently only level three and Beryl is four, but they couldn't take advantage of that window in mid. And as you rightly said, both supports were looking for it, but I think in Beryl's case, he was more aiming to cover. And now you can see him sweeping out that vision. Where has Mako warded? What little traps has he set up that I can clear out for my mid laner? He's not able to find anything. So now he'll make his way back towards bot as this wave is now making its way towards the tower. Yep, the Twisted Fate homework ward comes in <laughs> um, just to make sure that they can spot him potentially moving down for an early destiny. That will get instantly cleared. Of course, EDG, no strangers to that ward being a necessity. And so they're going to be fighting over that position quite a lot this series. As Khan body slamming his way in, it's a good trade. Uh, the, the only thing I really wanted to highlight there was the potential bot lane dive. There's the level six from Scout, and immediately EDG should be looking to make a move. EDG know that there's no ward in that brush, and yeah. Ghost is doing what he can to just clear out the wave with the Inferno. JJ moving on in, clears some things out, but it looks like the bottom lane are going to be okay for the moment. Canyon spots out the Xin Zhao, a scout moving on in as well. This could very, very quickly become dangerous for Darmon Kia, but right now, EDG holding on to the trigger. Yeah, and you can even see in these map movements from top side already, Flandre pushing out on top side, hovering down for a half roam towards bottom. Twisted Fate moving in. They already cleared out that ward that was behind the red to to really make mo the most of this leverage that they have around Dragon. No fight explodes. Well done here by Damwon. Again, 
coming into it, we're talking about them having to be the ones to play more cautiously and having to respect this early priority from EDG. Yeah, I really love the use of priority as well. It really is a dance. You might look at this and say, oh, lull state, nothing's happening. But the fact that Flandre gets to move down, the fact that you have EDG all coalescing on the bottom side of the map means that Dom1 have to answer that question instantly. They have to be communicating all the time to make sure that they're not able to be capitalized. I would like to see EDG try and find a successful TF ultimate before the Herald spawns, though. See if they can burn a few more flashes, maybe get an ultimate out here and there. Just get that small advantage ahead of the Herald because every single game this series, there has been some contests over the Herald. Last game, EDG just kind of watched Dom1 take it, but you know EDG is going to be in a position to try and contest that objective because of how much both teams value that first Herald. Now Damonk here dealing with this two versus three on the bottom side of the map. Canyon well and truly far away from this situation and no teleports are available, so Damon having to play pretty defensively. Level six gained for Canyon as he dives over this wall and there's five seconds until Shelly makes her appearance. She'll pop up now and Damon do have some control of the area and Khan has the push top lane. Bottom side you see early push here from EDG2 and the recall starting from Ghost. So you're getting the early shove down on bottom to be able to have the priority to rotate up there for it. Again, Jin as well with the extra range can uh, can get a pretty quick jump on it. Looks like the first attempt is going to be setting up here towards mid, trying to catch. The spidey who's, senses, Yeah, exactly. Though. Yeah. Who's, who's going to be one to overextend and no, nothing extended here? Now, I think what was really crucial there was just the awareness from Stout. It, a part of it is his pro player experience, but also he's looking at the map and he realizes, hang on, JJ was bot lane. That means that Canyon could have moved into our whole topside jungle and warded that whole part of the map, and Khan is missing. So with all these factors, there is a real good chance that they're threatening to dive, and so he respects it. Uh, so really good play there from Scout. And the setup here for Dom1 is quite good with vision control of the river heading over to it, but as well having the, the Braum ultimate and Gragas kind of play bodyguards through both these jungle quarters. EDG making the decision not to fight it at all. And you can see with Jin on bottom side, not only are they going to push out the bottom lane minion wave, but they also bring uh, support and jungle down to control bottom side river instead. And this might be that, that classic play that we saw. Rotate your Aphelios up top and then very quickly drop down the Rift Herald to try and even out this bottom lane trade that we're seeing on our screen right here. Viper, if he gets two plates, theoretically, that's a worth trade. Uh, for the Rift Herald, but if Damon Kier can use it for even more, that's going to be important. For I like this because the thing about trading bottom side push for Rift Herald is that you have to call off the trade once the Rift Herald is taken because it will push faster, way faster than you, and they actually rotate over to try and deny the full tower, just trying to stop it here at the charge. Yep. Red White don't fight here for Ghost because he does have some pretty good guns. There's the long range variety as well as Shakrams can rain down from a very long distance away. Want to be able to get this next plate though, as the Aphelios does want that plate gold. Showmaker able to shove this wave in once again, and he's taking control back here in this mid lane just a little bit. Damon Kia wanting to get more done, but Mako and Flandre answering here. The makeshift AD carry in the Jace. But well, our observers did a great job of highlighting Vipers ahead of Ghost in yeah, this play right. because while all of that gold was being shared in the top side for Darmwine, it was Viper that was a solo benefactor to receive three tower plates for himself. And typically for a Jin, the siege is quite slow because you do only have those four shots, you do have to reload. But Darmwine actually waited an extra wave before sieging. Uh, and I think in particular, they were waiting for Showmaker to be able to steal away Scout's ultimate so that in the event he tried to roam up top, he could also follow him so that there weren't a numbers disadvantage. Oh, Speaking Viper of... gonna start this one up and Khan has nowhere to go. It's a decent body slam to buy a couple of seconds time, but that's all he gets. First Blood goes for the Twisted Fate, and we talk about this. First Destiny, did it work? I'd say, yeah. Interesting, too. Viper holding his shot there and giving the money over purposely to Scout here uh, on the Twisted Fate gets two stacks in the Dark Seal as well. So a little bit of extra value squeezed out. And he'll get the Everfrost off the back of that, and look at that, two completed items immediately. Viper, thanks to all those early turret plates, and Scout, thanks to that first blood that he's going to get for himself. So EDG find themselves with a good early game gold lead, and gentlemen, I have to refer back to this graphic from earlier when we kind of look at these early game statistics. We saw it in the last game as well. When EDG get early game gold leads, that is when they look the most dominant and they look the most controlling. So definitely an excellent start for EDG in game three. Three minutes until that 15 minute point where we can really be sure of uh, how things are going to go. First Drake going to be taken for the first time here by Damwon Kia. And once again, no Cloud Soul. God. 
That's all I have to do. Get clouds on this thing. Nothing but disappointment for you. Yeah, but... absolutely. As uh, another plate being looked for here by Darmon on the bottom side, but they're going to have it denied for the next little moment. JJ looking for something here. Canyon waiting in the wings, but going to find too much more. It's... Chain CC to come through, but Scout doesn't have his jungler quite prepared for it. Is Mako going to get stunned up for the moment? Solar Flare actually going to come out defensively to allow the EDG support to make his way out. Darmon do get control of that brush, but are unable to clear out all of the vision from EDG. Now Scout underneath this turret able to push Showmaker. And there's going to be a small discrepancy in Silas Ultimate coming up a bit before Twisted Fate Ultimate, but Showmaker is going to recall now, so maybe. Oh, he cancels his base, actually. He wants to steal that ultimate, but it's just going to be catching the wave, and he'll have the teleport to get right back. Bottom side is uh, is going to be left alone as Flandre is going to get flashed on. Yeah, it's a big early flash from Flandre. I like the idea, but it ain't going to work. All of the teleports to come forward is now Khan is walking the wrong way, but maybe it's the correct one as they pick up the kill on the Twisted Fate. They knew the man advantage was coming in, and he puts himself in the right position to capitalize. Yep, steals that ultimate and look at the, the other side of the map, too, for, for Damwon, pushing into the tower, getting their advantages as well. And just really great play from Khan and Canyon. Flandre Flash is just a little too early. The threat was too much for him, and he panics under the pressure. That's the perfect opportunity for Damwon to get that initial kill, and they immediately create a numbers advantage. And then, oh my word, Showmaker stealing away Zhezhe's ultimate. Watch what he does to be able to set up the play. But this is where it starts. Flandre commits the Q. Flandre's like, I've got to get out. I know I'm dead. Um, so he's just trying to buy a little bit of time. But Khan sets that up very cleanly. He's able to get that initial pick. And then here, watch this steal from Showmaker. Steals away Zhezhe's ultimate, gets him behind, and then knocks him away. Oh, actually, it's the kick from Canyon that actually does more of the work. <laughs> so I gave a little too much credit there to Showmaker. But again, the three-man down one top side end up coming out on top. Yeah, those teleports coming in, though, definitely go going in their favor and bottom lane up to shield bow now for ghost farming away so come on feeling uh, pretty good even with the gold deficit they are facing having the dragon in their pocket and having a lot of good scaling to rely on and i will say for edg we haven't seen a huge amount of investment into the top side but another little skirmish kicks off yeah barrel actually forced to flash out here as jj does get him over the wall very nicely done they'll get a rift scuttler as well for added benefit and clear out all of this vision. Two minutes until the Drake, so not a lot to fight for down here necessarily. And Ghost is happily farming underneath his turret with a lot of his teammates waiting to back him up. And I think that as the game continues to progress, one of the things that we're going to be keeping our eyes on is the scaling advantage. Because I think that when it comes to straight up 5v5, Darmon have the stronger comp. Their engage isn't the most reliable. They are kind of relying on Showmaker to steal away some ultimates. But with the Aphelios, with the Gragas and the utility that can offer, sure, Jace will offer more damage in a side lane. And EDG's ability to attack sides is, of course, very prevalent. But when it comes to the straight front to back 5v5, Darmon is in a very good position with what they've drafted for themselves. Exactly. We've seen so many teams at Worlds utilizing this strategy exactly from EDG, using the tools they have to spread the map and put pressure on them on both of those sides, opening it up, using the Twisted Fate to roam. And they, in the past, the Silas hasn't been able to keep up, but Showmaker has been ahead of it here. In the earlier teleport, double on top side, being able to pick this one up, now hovering uh, and running straight top as well to back this one up. Uh, they definitely have it under control. Yep. Second Rift Herald has been a point of contention all series so far. Let's see who's actually going to win the positional war. Right now you can see EDG with a whole host of members there. As, there it is. Yep, there it is. Scout moving towards that top side and Khan nowhere to go. Some Al Alcove Gaming isn't going to work out in his favor and three versus one's a bit unfair if you ask me. Well done for EDG creating the play. Damwon did everything right, but then they left a small window with which Scout was immediately able to capitalize on. Gets that kill onto Khan, 20 seconds is a death timer. He has teleport as EDG start off the Herald. Canyon not going to be able to find the Sonic Wave just there, and Shirley has began. Still 10 seconds on that clock, and you can see EDG trying to rush this one down. Gold card connects onto Beryl, but he is, of course, quite tanky. Ghost now trying to get himself into position. Not exactly optimal weaponry, but he'll take it. As now the teleport to come forward from the Gragas. The fight has begun as Beryl looked to get the ultimate off. He did manage to get there as Mako locks down the kill. And Khan with full health, not able to get anything done. And the Eye of the Herald still awaiting in the pit. Will be picked up there by Flandre. This is such a big win for EDG because, yes, they're able to focus the fire and get the kill, but also getting that Eye of the Rift Herald onto the Jace. 
further accentuates their split pushing needs with this composition. Even though they give up the dragon, they're happy to blow open the side of the map now. This is where you want to play with Twisted Fate. Wandre will be able to get topside tower, still has the Rift held in pocket and gives him a lot of pushing power. Yeah, that's also first brick as well, going over to the Jace, able to lock that on down himself. So I'm glad you uh, accentuated that point because <laughs> Wandre being strong is going to be very important for EDG. It certainly is. We do see the Braum hovering around. Fondre needs to be careful not to overextend because the resets aren't going to come through soon. And this could be danger for Flandre. Yeah, Winter's Bite comes down and this is going to be the Chain CC. Khan's able to lock down that kill with a bop from the barrel and it's going to be absolutely fine for Damwon Kia. So Flandre punished just a little bit there. Small timings for both of these top laners. In the previous one, there were hovers behind Khan just before. As soon as their hovers leave, then the play comes out. He's, he's up too far in the lane, and Twisted Fate ultimately comes through. Then, this time around as well, the hovers are there, but as soon as the recall completes, Barrel comes through, lands the Q, and they pick off the opposing top laner. The difference is there's no objective afterwards. You know, what I've learned from watching this series is that even if you are a professional player, some champions just don't let you play the game. <laughs> Last game, it was Malzahar and Kiana. This game, Gragas and Brawl. Uh, the Perma CC combo that prevents you from ever getting to do anything. But it will result in a big pick for Darmon. EDG, though, maintaining control over the gold lead. And it's pretty interesting how things have pivoted. You know, we've seen a lot of like back and forth trades throughout this series, but now it is Darmon for the first time in this series that have firm control over the Drakes. Uh, they will invest in them very early uh, and we'll see if they can actually threaten the soul and force EDG into these fights when EDG really wants to try and attack sides and look for picks. Oop, rooted on the Ghost. Viper actually getting in there with the Gale Force, but unable to actually lock him down. But they do get the Shield Bow, which could be very important. Shirley comes down, looking to take down this outer turret in the mid lane as Showmaker now here to defend as well. They're not going to be able to stop the charge. A Showmaker down to 50%, not able to get any value out of the Everfrost either. And EDG taking some power back. Yeah, they get a lot of damage on mid, but they're also split pushing on bottom side too with the Twisted Fate. They're going to continue to try and spread the map here. Now, after top side has already fallen, the domino effect starts to chain through the map here. Bottom side, only a couple more hits there. He's actually hovering a little bit back because the mid lane pressure has to relent slightly and so doesn't want to overextend and get picked off. Leaves just the remnants of the tower here. But with it going down there, not being able to get local gold, just going to be the global. Yep, Damon Kia now back to defending this outer turret. It should go down very, very comfortably, especially with the teleport to come through from Scout. You know exactly what EDG want here. It looks like they should be able to take it. Four members now grouping up here in the mid lane. The CC is good as the Moonlight Vigil does not find any targets. Showmaker off to the side now has a Solar Flare available. And Darmok here do get them away from their turret for now. It's on a slither of HP though. One more hit should secure it for EDG and Scout goes back to base, secures himself the Rapid Fire Cannon. This pick potential from EDG is now accelerated as he lands an initial stun. And this is what you're going to be seeing a lot of. Stun into poke, stun into poke. Viper can also follow up with the W as well. And Darwin is just going to get chipped away at. And this is one of the weaknesses of their composition. Showmaker with the ultimate, Khan with his engage. Those are the primary engage tools. And if they can't land them, then EDG is going to keep chipping away at those health bars. And EDG have such a high priority on getting these outer towers down. Stun use. There's a solar flare as well as Scout is going to get rooted, but he's going to be able to walk his way out. A little bit worse for wear, but otherwise absolutely fine. Darmon Kia will just clear out the wave, claiming some control over the mid lane. Now, the advantage for Darmon in all of this was that they were successfully able to push out top and bot. That top wave did actually go underneath the tower, so now it's bouncing back in favor of Darmon. And the same thing is happening in the bot side of the map. So Darmon, while they were able to hold on to their mid tier one, which is sure to fall, a lot of farm ended up being lost in the side lanes that EDG could have grabbed, but instead they committed hard to trying to take down that mid tier one. And Flandre here towards the bottom side, doing some tidying up from the mess that you were talking about there, Vettius. And even without that turret being taken, it is still a considerable lead here for EDG. Of course, Twist of Fate does help out with that one as Beryl is going to say hi to Mako. Doesn't quite find the queue as a teleport to come forward from Khan, just to get himself back onto the map. And all eyes are now on the soul point. This infernal soul going to be very important for Darmon Kia to still threaten some tempo in this game. Exactly, since they, they haven't been able to get the last bits of that tower down, they haven't been able to put as much pressure on the other side of the map. EDG are kind of now forced into the spot that Damwon are looking for, where they've got a control word through River. They have so many good counter 
engaged options available to them, and EDG are just trying to run through and take it over. Yeah, Showmaker once again with that Crescent Guard. There is so much displacement available for Damwon Kia. The kickback distance that Canyon can have available with the follow-up from both the mid laner and the top laner is just immense, but EDG still a force to be reckoned Ooh. with. Scout over to the side, finds the stun onto Canyon, but Canyon doesn't worry about it too much. And the setup for this poke, I mean, there's only so many unbreakable cooldowns that you have available to yourself as the turret does finally go down in that mid lane. Damwon Kia want to secure this Drake. Can JJ do it again? Can he lock down the smite? Is the question. Showmaker waiting off to the side, chooses his moment now, flashes on forward onto Viper, but Viper not actually out of position just yet. Sets up the curtain call to look to lock down Damwon Kia. They will be able to get their soul point, and they take down the jungler as well. Scout going golden, Showmaker dashing forward, uses his stopwatch as well, but there is no follow-up. Four members of Damwon Kia now desperately trying to run away, just out of range of the shock block. And down one successfully complete the heist. Calm, that jolly fellow moves quick. He just <laughs> barely got away from the shock blast, and they got what they came for, Atlas. They got the dragon. Drake secured there for Dom One. It was quite close, and Showmaker goes in with this attempt at the knockback play, stealing away the Zen ultimate. Doesn't quite get the knockback he wants, but still, he's afforded the extra safety uh, of the defenses of it, and it buys them time to secure before getting out. You could feel the tension in this fight as Showmaker is the one that initiates the play. JJ gets so low, but is able to flash out to safety, and then this ultimate from Khan creates a lot of disruption that makes it very difficult for Flandre to really get involved. Uh, the stopwatch comes through from Showmaker. He realizes <laughs> the position that he's put himself in. And then Viper sees his opportunity to try and clean up. But Khan just barely able to get away from the Shock Blast. Ends I up agree, being Khan. a one that, for one. That was a backside graze, if ever I've seen one. He felt the heat of that Shock Blast when he was over that wall. That was definitely a brow wipe, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> yeah. But that does mean that Darwan now securing themselves three Drakes. They will be at Soul Point, And we will have another tense fight. But look at this, EDG. 4k up in gold. Towers is where they're getting a lot of their gold lead. And of course, the Twisted Fate passive assisting as well. But they have so much more control over the map. It makes it much easier for them to control the river and move into Darwin's jungle. And one of the big reasons why Twisted Fate is so highly prized is that it allows you the extra vision coverage to be able to get the most out of some of these periods in the game where Damwon don't have another dragon coming up for three minutes over here. So they're trying to play a bit of catch as far as catching a lot of these push on the minion waves and giving up some of that side lane pressure, respecting that Twisted Fate and the pick potential that EEG have to show. But EDG need to push this forward until the next dragon comes up because, again, that Infernal Soul is what Dom One have going for them. That's their big comeback potential here. And that's sort of the ace in the hole as well because Dom One have the composition that wants to team fight, right? And uh, if EDG are playing the optimal game for themselves, it's split push. It's being able to play the side lanes and forcing Dom One out of their five man unit. But come that Infernal Drake fight, they're going to have to all be there. They're going to have to agree to Damon Kia's terms unless they can change the game beforehand. The player that I'm keeping my eyes on is Flandre because as the game progresses, this Jace is only going to continue to scale up. He's now just finished his third item. His poke is lethal. And when you're having that dance around the dragon, landing that shock blade will be massive. And you think about Ghost, yes, Ophelio scales very well into the late game, but when it comes to range, Twisted Fate with the Rapid Fire Cannon, the poke from a Jace, the W from Viper and his ultimate. How easy is Ghost actually going to have access to these team fights if EDG don't ever fully commit as we see a fight kicking off? Yeah, Crescent Guard comes through to try and keep JJ alive and it's going to work. Now it puts it on cooldown and he loses half of his health bar, but still the trade of ultimates works out in favor of EDG. Scout teleports back in with a Zon Zonya's freshly constructed. He's got all of the utility that he wants right now. And EDG again, they gotta return to the split pushing, uh, immediately sending Flandre right up to topside. He still has his teleport, and they can actually use the Twisted Fate ultimate uh, to really complement that split pushing, even though Damwon have done a good job of retaining control of their vision in their red quadrant here. This is one of the biggest things for their setup around that Baron. If EDG try and threaten there, they try and threaten the turns and the picks with Twisted Fate and draw you out. Uh, the important thing is that the safety of those extra wards are allowing Dom on that uh, more, more slow and cautious lead up to it. Well, with control of the mid lane, they are able to move towards this Dragon Pit. Still a minute on it, but Dom on Kia do need to try and get out onto the Rift. 
And EDG have done a fantastic job forcing them back, making sure that they have no access to the area. And as you can see with the vision, not a lot of opportunity. Thankfully, there is a Rift Scuttler that is providing irremovable vi vision for the moment. That is all they have to lean on right now is Star One fresh off some backs, now looking to try and reassert themselves onto the map. Also, just look at these waves. Bolt wave is being pushed in. Top wave is kind of stuck in a bit of an awkward spot now for Darn One as well. And EDG is just keeping control over mid. So that issue that we talked about earlier, not a big one for EDG right now. They can just keep poking, keep threatening as EDG maintain control on the entrances to the river as Darn One want to try and secure themselves the Dragon's Hall. Yeah. Darmon don't necessarily have to fight them. They right? don't. Because they're the team that has the sole point. That is the luxury afforded them, as Mako taking a fair bit of damage there, as Ghost has some pretty good guns for this potential battle. EDG now grouped up as five, and this is exactly how Darmon want them. They've got so much displacement and so much control. Showmaker once again with the Crescent Guard. But can they actually find the engage that they're looking for? Q goes wide there from Canyon. Vision still just being fought for here. Into the darkness goes Canyon. Off to the side, lands the Q this time. And EDG moving back. They're not wanting to commit. As now Showmaker off on the flank, I believe was just spotted. And definitely is now with the Chain Lash being looked at. And Damwon Kia looking for some stuns. They haven't fully committed just yet. As Canyon dives on over, but he's immediately popped. Can't make the big play. Can't into the backside though. He'll be able to do it. Locks down Scout before he can do anything. And Ghost grabs the kill onto JJ. And this is the team fight that Damwon Kia have been looking for all game long. Flandre goes down as well, and Mako, he's running for the hills, but he's not going to be able to stop this infernal soul going down. That's going to be so big. Not only do they stop the soul, but they can also just run straight up to bear, and they have so much damage. EDG have not been able to split push strong enough. They have not been able to spread out Dom One. They have been able to secure it. Soul for Darwin, the team fight power of the flanks coming through. And look at how Darwin just kind of heard EDG like sheep. And keep your eyes on Showmaker here. Yes, Canyon loses his life at the start, but Showmaker gets access onto this backline. Initial engage comes out from Khan, the follow up from Showmaker. The team fight becomes split as Ghost has unlimited protection from Beryl to set up for the perfect collapse. EDG fall, Darwin secure soul, and Darwin looking to go series point. And when I saw Canyon go down there, I thought that this was going to be an EDG fight. They were going to be able to stop that playmaking. But I get reminded of my friend Jake Spawn Tiberi telling me about something. I think it was back in 2015. He was talking about Gragas. I'm like, why don't you pick Lee Sin in the jungle anymore? He's like, no, Gragas is just better Lee Sin. And we saw <laughs> Khan go into that backline and demonstrate that you can do all of that CC, but you get to do it on everyone. It's great follow up there because Canyon getting focus fire and burned down early. Uh, with that stun was an opening, but the follow-up that you're talking about so big from Khan and Showmaker right into the back line, burning them up. It was just the way in which EDG were being herded, you know? Yeah. They initially, they lost control over mid, then they lost control over the river, and slowly they were being pincered in, and this is one of Darmwon's many great strengths. Their ability to teamfight, their ability to navigate these situations is what has made them a world champion before and is what could make, very well make them world champion again. Yep, they were able to bide their time through all of the early pressure, playing that, that cautious game, giving the respect for the Twisted Fate plays and all the attempted picks coming out from EDG. This is a very similar position that EDG uh, found themselves in, but they were on, in Damwon's shoes against Gen.G. They were down a similar amount. Oh, sorry, they were up a similar amount, but it's the Dragon Soul that is creating so much power here for Damwon Kia. And of course, EDG were able to close out that game, game number one in their best of five in the semis as Mako taking a lot of damage. Damwon Kia unable to commit to this one just yet. As the Everfrost comes forward as well, they're trying to soak as many cooldowns, but Damwon Kia just playing it safe. And that can get dangerous, as you can see, these shot blasts are really hurting. The poke is one of the tools that EDG really do need to leverage now. They're trying to soften them up a bit before the all-in comes. And pushing up mid lane, they will be able to get just the recall out. That's, uh, that hurt me. <laughs> Joe's taking most of his health bar there. Now Darmon just looking to try and defend this inner turret. They will do so, that uh, control ward getting a lot of value. Being able to throw some extra poke over, and now it's EDG with control over this Baron. It really has been a dance yeah. all game. And you can still feel the tension. Even though Darmwon feel like the favorites to win this game, the gold is still very even. 
the items are very similar. You can see a bit of a discrepancy now as Ghost has gone back to base and secured himself the Bloodthirster. Yet to see any healing reduction come out from the side of EDG, but we talked about the scaling on Aphelios and you saw the damage that he was able to output in that last fight. Yeah, range may be a problem, but if he gets into range, the damage is very real. Yeah, it feels like he's just playing Graves. <laughs> it's just Aphelios cosplaying Graves right now because he's got basically the same item build. Looking forward to seeing how Ghost is going to be able to play these team fights right now with uh, the Crescendum and Calibrum available as they move into this river to try and secure this Baron. So much vision available here for EDG, though. This is not going to be a secret, and Darmwon knows it as they start off the Baron right now. But Flandre is so far away from this. Teleport is available if he wants to use it as now the chain CC goes down onto Barrel, but he keeps himself alive for so long. We've traded knockbacks everywhere. There is so much Crescent Guarding going on, but no real fight has broken out. As Darmon Kia this time press all their buttons, but don't get that pick but that they were afforded last time. Darmon get what they want, which is a health advantage. JJ is forced to flash. He is out of the pit. Mako has to go back to base because he doesn't have the HP, and Darmon can immediately go back to the Baron, and it melts thanks to the damage from Ghost. Well, the curtain call comes in. Can Viper do enough damage to deter Darmon Kia from this Baron as Showmaker? There is a Blast Cone still available. Looks for the chain, but doesn't quite get there as Canyon gets the kickback, immediately goes in to the stopwatch. Beautifully done, and they're going to be the picks. The top side goes down first, and it's a bloodbath. Oh man, he couldn't do it last time, but that time, Canyon, beautiful. Perfect turn here from Dawan as they chase oh, down oh, sure, Viper Mako. as well. And that will be the Baron this time around for Dawan. They get the full reward for their turnaround. Canyon, yeah, last time around, gold card right in the face. This yep. time gets the kickoff with the flash into the stopwatch. And this is going to be the big push. That team fight, Betty has is been able to bide its time and with the extra damage from the soul as well. It's just patience is the best way to describe Darmon because you never see them over force. You don't see them pull the trigger like that. I mean, they do, but at just the right <laughs> the moment is the point that I'm trying to get at, right? They just wait for the perfect moment and you, you just kind of, as much as you try, you just can't prepare for it. And Canyon was the one that set up that play, but everything before it, just such great execution. You can really see why Darmon is considered a favorite to win the whole thing. Yeah, they they just have such great composure on this big stage, you know, in the finals. It comes with the confidence of being previous world champions, but Canyon, that was so beautiful. Clean. He that kicked him here. right Into in Khan. to the Gragas body slam. Never let the body touch the floor. And it's <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. That song that the bodies hit the floor, not apparent in this game, just perfect one I mean, shot. The, the bodies hit the floor, they just didn't have a health bar when they did so. There was a lot of them though. And you can see the frustration on the yeah. EDG coaching staff, of course. Even if they fall short, hey, still more opportunities to come, and EDG have done a great job going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Let's see if they can make the miracle happen and turn this game around. It is looking like a tough one, as Darmon is now looking to siege onto the base of EDG. Yep, 35 minutes on the clock, so the gold, not necessarily a relevant point, but this Baron, so important, and the fact that Darmon Kia have hit their stride with their composition is just so important. Khan, off to the side, he can play bodyguard so beautifully on this Gragas as well. As you can see, just up to the front line, feeling very good, and the Elder Drake has spawned. Now the team fight gonna break out yet again as Beryl going down very, very low, but Viper was the target, and Viper will be taken down. Beryl, so he's still alive! What is going on here? Flandre and Scout, the last men standing, and look at this, they're stealing it, thankfully. Beryl finally falls as the Destiny steals away that kill, but it's still a massive fight win for Darmon Kia. Yeah, it's going to be a massive fight win, and that is going to lay destruction to the base. Teleport immediately over for the push with the Baron. Make the most of it. Yep, they decide that they don't even need the Elder Drake because, of course, the Nexus is the prime target, and Darmon Kia are pushing forward. It's going to be this one caster minion that will be the hero right now as Scout. The only one here that can try to defend. JJ up relatively soon. Mako as well. Viper also only five seconds, but the Nexus is exposed and Darmwon Kia will move to match point in this series. A very close early game between the two teams. It felt like EG were getting a little bit ahead. We did see them get a couple of very good fights, but in the fights that mattered most, it was Darmwon that came out on top. That Dragon's stacking ended up paying off massively for them. And I feel like that if this game is going to be a battle of team fights, then EDG needs to go back to what they found so much success with so far in this tournament. Drafting more for team fights, drafting more for the 5v5, and 
ultimately what allowed them to beat Gen G was that team fighting prowess. So let's see how they bounce back in game four. Yeah, ultimately I like the gambit that actually paid off for Dom One and Champ Select here, leaving up all three power picks, allowing the Twisted Fate to be taken over, and then being being able to actually play the early game with caution around those opportunities and not fall victim to the picks. Yeah, it really does feel like a beautiful dance within the draft to begin things, but only one win separates Dom One Kia from back-to-back -back world titles. And the analyst desk will be back to set the stage for match point. I didn't order any pizza. Jake from State Farm. After you saved me so much dough on insurance with that Parker promo, I devised a promo for you. Here's the deal, Parker. State Farm offers everyone surprisingly great rates. Yeah, right. Pepperoni pockets, an atomic brownie, cuckoo crusty. There's no promo, it's just great rates. And a cider ranch. You're the man, man. When you want the real deal, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Cheating. They smell in bear. And it improves performance. I don't know. This is going to change gaming forever. Red Bull gives you wings. I woke up to the morning sky first Baby blue just like we rehearsed
Welcome back to the State Farm Analyst Desk. EDG may have taken the first game, but Dom Juan Kia puts oh. two together. Oh, Watch, out, Watch out, Dom's out, Angel. That just went past my shoulder. <laughs> almost got you with that one. Jesus, come on. Wow. Down, they put two together to bring us to match point. 2 1 now between Dom Juan Kia and EDG. It's the defending world champions who find themselves now in a winning position. Of course, it didn't necessarily come easily, though, uh, because I think one again will start in the draft and then we'll get it to the early game that was crafted by EDG that definitely pushed Dom Juan to the limit. Yeah, perfect early game. It all came down to that mid gank that we'll see later on where Scout was kind of unlocked. But just looking at the draft, we were very interested to see what EDG will do on blue side. Damon on red side, they left open a lot of OPs. They traded TF for the Lee Sinophilios. So it was a good trade initially, and people might wonder why aren't they early rotating Jin? Well, they have to play heavy top side of the TF, right? Instalock Jace, Instalock a winning jungle matchup, focus on the top side. This draft is very similar to Damon versus FPX on group stage day four. I think it was the second time they faced up against Chitara, where Nori was actually playing Gragas. Damon had the TF Jace, and they played over side lanes and they played over side lanes so well to perfection that's where their gold leads came from but EDG found themselves more leaning towards team fights. Yeah absolutely I, I was just surprised though that Damon actually prioritized the Aphelios over the Jin for themselves right because they could have actually grabbed it in their first rotation and it feels like it's just something that has been so incredibly impactful for them so I was surprised to see it fall that far down in the draft but it, it's always interesting because you know we've seen this this Gragas into Jace mm. plus TF combo a number of times and I do think in the individual matchup it goes up pretty well but you you're, you're so easy to pick on, right? And that was always my concern going into this game. Yeah, uh, I like the Jin or rather the Aphelios call out, but I do think it's nice for Damwon to pick up a win on the Aphelios. It yep. buys them some real estate when it comes to champions like looking forward. You talk about the abuse to the top lane. We'll get to that Magic in belly. just a moment as well. Every second counts though here at the World Championship. And thanks to the reliable Cisco Network, Scout makes the great escape in the mid lane, gets two flashes in the process. We called out this mid lane matchup saying Showmaker came up big in game two. Scout needed to step it up in game three, and he definitely did early. I think small misplay from Canyon when he connects the Q. I think he should E flash, auto attack Scout until he wants to flash away and then follow with Q. Mm. Otherwise, just go for the straight kill. He just kind of instantly Qs and then they hesitate on the re on the dive. I think the auto attack was canceled by Canyon. Yeah, it there. looked like it was. Scout canceled. should have died there. And he should be playing TF into he should be playing no flash TF into Silas Lee Sin with first blood and he should struggle more. But because he didn't die, that helped the map so much. I agree he should have died, but it's also of note that he had a potion running that entire time. And again, those are those minor differences. Like six he walked HP, away with yeah, six. 6 HP at the end of that. He was at 9 health earlier, ticked up, then down to 6 HP, yeah. and he gets away. And with that, blowing one flash for two on the other side and avoiding the gank, it definitely sets Scout up now to look for those side lane plays and start taking advantage of top lane. Oh, yeah, we definitely. We talked about it. How does Damon want to play the game through mid? They attempted it. It didn't work. Scout, he kind of negated all the pressure in mid-jungle now because they both lost flash, and now he can play his global to perfection and snowball the side lanes. You talked about it, Azale. Playing the Gragas into TFJ feels like you really struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when you're going this AP build, the 1v1 is absolutely fine, but you have very little survivability. You are going to get picked on. If TF shows up, you're almost always going to die if you don't have teammates already behind you. But though he did get picked on a lot, he still came up big in the team fights and they got a lot of value out of the pick. And that's it. That's where the value comes from, right? The team fights. Gragas engages are great. Vedius was talking about it on the cast test saying the follow-up engage is great. You have a Braum, but now you have a Gragas who can go first. The Braum can follow. And it's all about the Aphelios free hitting. And that's the whole point of Damwon's comp. Their team fights are pretty good because you have so many champions that can make clutch plays, right? The Aphelios guns, if they're perfect, can just take over the fight. The Silas leases in such big playmaking and Khan's engages. Right. Well, so that's the thing, right? You, you get to this point and it does sound like hey, everything's moving in favor of EDG, yeah. though. Okay, avoids the first gank, starts getting his pressure out to the side lanes. That's exactly how the team wants to play. But ultimately, Dom Juan did come back of note. Dragon stacking, definitely coming in. Uh, but Azale, help me figure it out. Help me understand how it is that Dom Juan came out on top in this one. I mean, I do think a lot of it was just about playing around the dragons, right? You know, EDG had actually created a gold lead for themselves. The third dragon always feels so pivotal in those types of games where you are ahead in gold, but you're down in dragons. If you can prevent that third dragon from coming through, you kind of maintain control in the game. But Dom Juan's team fighting around this dragon was so big for them. Time and time again, they were able to fend off EDG, even from a deficit, and then secure themselves the soul into the Baron. I have to say, Canyon's play here with the flash kick onto Flandre. Stop watching this oh, time around. Into the worked. belly. We saw in the dragon fight, Canyon tried to do the same thing, but as he ward jumped over, Flandre used the to the skies in hammer form on Jace, so he went over the wall, so Canyon couldn't get the initial kick, but Khan with the engage was flawless. And of course, Jace damage with the poke was fantastic, and that's how EDG had to play the fights. They had to poke, and then use the Jin W, use the Jin ult, wait for TF rapid fires. This was their setup. 
up. But if the fight's already kicked off, the poke is useless. Well, and I have to say, around, around the third and the fourth dragon, they weren't actually able to land a lot of poke. The shock blasts weren't landing. They weren't able to find the follow-up. They weren't actually able to combine with rapid fire gold cards. And that felt like the biggest problem is that when they're able to land that, they can soften up and they can actually then go in and start a fight off themselves, but they just weren't able to do it. Two things on that post-game breakdown there. Khan's damage up over 30k. Absolutely nutty to see him putting up that kind of a damage performance on the Jace in the side lane necessary as he tries to chase his first world title. The second thing I'll call out is gold graphs because that's something we looked at earlier in the day, Cadrill, this idea that both of these teams with leads generally pretty good. EDG had a solid lead, would expect him to win from that position. Dom Juan, though, the comeback kings. Yeah, Dom Juan, great team fighting to come back. I have to say on that poking point there as well, I just love the builds from Ghost going early BT to make sure that he can heal to yeah. poke itself so he can sustain, but massive, massive games for Khan. He is one game away from becoming a world champion. This could be his final game as a League of Legends professional player. And I just think that that's so crazy when you're going into it and this could be the last time you play, you know, as a pro. He has played for so many years. Yeah. He has had so many important games over the course of his career, but this one dwarfs all of them by so much. If you're going to go out, you want to go out a world champion. No better way to do no it. There's no better way oh, to do it. Definitely. Of course, for Dom Juan looking for that back-to-back -back world titles. They're one game away. EDG, though, not not down and out without a fight. The reigning world champions have turned the finals on its head and are now just one win away from back-to-back -back titles. Match point is just minutes away, so don't touch that browser. See you soon.